the world wobbles as it spins. It wobbles terribly because it's inhabited by men and women who shake internally, whose daily lives are a series of frustrations and tensions and confusions. So what else would you expect for the whole world to shake and tremble when everyone on it is doing it just that? And if you'd like to know at the very start the cause of all stress, all anxiety, all nervousness, I will give it to you. And as I tell you what it is, will you look back at yourselves at the moment I tell you and try to see how true it is of your personal life, no matter what your life is today, whether it's financially successful or otherwise, or whether you have a nice comfortable home or not. When I tell you the cause of all human tension and anxiety, try to connect it with your own life, with your own mind. You are in anxiety, you're in all sorts of irritation and confusion about yourself because you live in self-doubt. Self-doubt. You don't know who you are. You don't know what you're doing here. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing with your life here on earth. But you say you do. What a tragedy. What a shame that you have continued into your inner conflict, continued with it so long without investigating fearlessly the cause of it which is the fact that you don't know who you are at all and you're looking desperately around trying to find someone who will tell you or some event that will tell you. And oh, what a very, very curious condition. Because look, can you see how many identities, how many labels you have just here tonight? Let's name a few. You're an American, you're a businessman, you're a parent, you're a voter, you're a citizen, you're a resident of a certain state. Look, look, you have hundreds of ideas about yourself. You have dozens of ways to describe yourself and in spite of them and the changing and the additional ones, in spite of that, the nervousness and the pain and the strain remains. What a very curious situation then that we have, we make all these efforts to try to calm down the inner ache and it hasn't succeeded, has it? All we do is work hard, work desperately at the wrong thing, and go to bed, go to bed every single night, just as worried, just as helpless as we did the night before. The whole situation that I've talked about up until now can be investigated, it can be understood, it can be received and it can be changed. This means that you, whoever you are, man, woman, young person, older person, listening to what we're saying tonight, you can begin to enter a different kind of a world than the one you now occupy, which is not a happy world at all, and nobody knows it better than you. You're the one living in that world, and you're the one who's suffering from it. And I'm here tonight, today, to tell you that you can change. And here's where we're going to start. If being a carpenter or a successful man about town, or being a successful parent or whatever, if these labels do not do anything for us, then what will? 
We'll find out right now. Find out by, by discovering that there are two kinds of cells. And the first one that I'm going to describe, you know all about it because it is your present life. One self which the vast majority of human beings live in, you can call it the outlaw self. Outlaw self. Now why do we call it that? Simply because human being living this kind of life is outside the spiritual laws that he could live under. He's outside the calm and the understanding and the poise that could be his if he was to cease to be an outlaw. To be an outlaw simply means to be in these states we described earlier, one in which you don't know what you're doing. You don't know, you didn't know what to do today, but you did it because the automatic compulsive forces carried you through. But you, Ah, listen to me, please. You didn't like most of the things you did today, did you? You didn't like the thoughts you thought. You didn't like the feelings that went through you. You didn't like the way you didn't, didn't handle that situation at all correctly. You didn't like the way you mishandled it. The outlaw self is simply an artificial personality in which most human beings live, and which has no reality to it. It has no, how do you like this? It has no future to it at all, because it's a time state. It's a state built up in time according to your conditioning, to what people told you you should be. Wouldn't you like to have a state? Isn't there, isn't there something in you that yearns for something that's going to last more than this present life? I will tell you that it exists, but it does not exist within the realm of the outlaw self. Aren't you tired enough yet? Aren't you tired of being like a outlaw in the Old West who gets on his horse after committing a crime and he rides out into the hills. I'm describing human beings. I'm describing your life and you know it. And he rides the horse out into the hills evading the sheriff's posse. And he feels, he feels temporarily safe when he finds a cave or a gully or a rock to hide behind. And he can see the you can see the posse coming miles away. Don't you feel that you're living under a threat? Of course you do. This is no way to live at all. I'm trying to get a point over to you of supreme importance that the way you are now going through your life is no life at all and you know it. You try to kid your tension. You try to evade your nervousness. You try to run away from your hostility and you'll never succeed and you never have. You can start because there's a way out, because there's a, another way to handle life, and to under, which is to understand life. So here's our outlaw running, am I describing your life now? <clears throat> running from gully to cave, from cave to rock, from rock to the back of a hill somewhere, never, never being able to rest at all because something, because something is chasing him. Shall I tell you what it is? Now we'll switch back to our life. Shall I tell you what's chasing you? Your own nature. The nature you have preferred. You are living the exact kind of life you have asked for. You are getting exactly what you want. Some life, some tragedy, something is going to have to come along and force you against your own egotistical will to see where you are so you can say, I don't want to be out in the hills anymore running, running, running scared all the time, wondering if I'm going to be able to last one more day out there. That outlaw is all alone, isn't he? He's isolated. He's apart from the world. 
He's not in harmony with the rest of the world. He's way out there in the edges of things. Well, isn't his loneliness and isolation very characteristic of your day? Of course it is. Are you beginning to understand then what we're understand what we're getting at? that you're living a certain kind of a condition because you have chosen it, and maybe, maybe the reason you have selected that kind of a nervous, tense life is because no one has ever told you about something different. Tonight you were hearing about something different, and you can start to change tonight. You can begin to see that there is no necessity and there is certainly no, no glory. And being out in those hills, being chased all the time. Don't you feel chased? You know very well you do. Someone gives you a frown and you feel chased. Your money disappears a little faster than you think it should and you feel chased by economics. And you're never, never quite able to identify the enemy and I'll tell you why you're not. Because you're putting it outside of you instead of inside yourself. It's your own confusion that is the outlaw. It's your own refusal to see and understand this that keeps your life going the way it is. Now look, I know very well all the escapes you use out there in the hills so you duck behind them and you have a moment of what you call peace. Eh, hiding behind that rock, you're still scared. The posse's still coming. Here is one of the rocks that you hide behind. It's called having someone to be with, having someone to talk with. Who is it? spouse, friend, your television set. And you sit here right now listening to this talk and you don't understand how quickly you would collapse if one of your supports were taken away. Just as if the rock was to suddenly roll away in front of the outlaw and there, there was the sheriff and the posse out seeing him as the rock rolled away. Every time you break down, which you do all the time, every day, many times a day, every time you break down, you get anxious, you get nervous, you get irritable, you get hateful, which you do, and hide it. That's why you keep it. Every time you break down, it's because the rock has rolled away temporarily and you're exposed to yourself and that makes you nervous. And then you quickly run to the next rock, the next boulder, and hide behind it. Have you ever heard of such a thing as living from your own nature, from your own real nature, from your essence? Ah, now, now we are talking about the lawful self. The lawful self. You can start to acquire it. If you love truth more than you love your wife, more than you love your husband, more than you love your money, more than you love your phony reputation, you can begin to, you can begin to have a lawful life in which you'll be out of the desert forever and not running anymore. It comes as a start through information such as you're hearing tonight, through application of the knowledge, comes through a very, very firm self-honesty about your condition. It, com it comes when you start to love something different than what you now love. What you now love is your own mechanical nature, which by the way, you also hate. What a situation. You both like it and dislike it, and you're caught in it. This new nature that we're talking about does not come through any human being at all, does not come through any human organization. No group can give it to you. Even your own mind, as it presently works, can't give it to you. It comes to, it comes to an outlaw, male or female, who has been out in those hills dodging and cringing so long and so wearily that he begins to wonder if there might be a way out of the whole problem and he begins to investigate it. See, all our life, because we, didn't in, we did indeed know no better, 
we looked around the world at another human being, a, what you ladies would call a handsome man or a pretty girl or any kind of a man or a woman, or you looked through a certain activity or a certain financial venture or a certain set of daydreams, and you look to those to give you peace from being an outlaw, and it won't work. What you have to do is to cease to be an outlaw altogether so that you begin to have a new nature which is one with itself and which is getting its guidance and its inspiration, real inspiration, from something higher than this world. Come on, come on now. Don't you suspect, and it's a right suspicion, that this world has nothing right to give you? Suspicion? It ought to be a thundering conviction with you because it never has given you anything worthwhile, anything lasting. I told you, you say that home you have, that business you have, those friends you have, you say that they keep you from being scared, then how come you're still scared having them? You say, you say they keep the posse at bay at a distance. How come you tremble and have to hide behind the rocks, which is this hiding behind your own justifications, behind your own delusions? Picture a, a lake, pretty lake, way up in, high up in the mountains, pure water. And the lake begins to flow down in a form of a stream and it winds its way on down to the desert. And down in the desert there are human beings, such as the kind we've talked about. In this life, let me tell you something startling, and something that you should start right tonight to see thoroughly. Here's this water that could take away the thirst of those human beings down in the desert and it flows all the way down. And maybe one man, one woman, out of all those people living down in the dry desert, only one or two come over and drink the water. And having tasted it, having tasted it, they want to find the source, and so they start climbing the mountain. Most human beings are not going to even find the water because they say they already have it. How, how astonishing that a man or a woman can say that they have a spiritual life even, or can say that they're content, and all the time they're saying it, you're reading their faces and it tells the exact opposite story. So we have the two selves. Most people live with the outlaw self, continue to live with it. You can be different if you want. You can start to change if you want. And when you do, all this anxiety and stress tension that we talked about will begin to fade because the outlaw nature fades so does everything connected with it and a lot lot more your daily worry about the future for example and best of all or one of the best of all is a change in your need to protect yourself to be defensive have you noticed how touchy you are people come around and touch you in the wrong place and you you jump and you have, to, you have to always be on guard. Wouldn't it be nice to, to be able to just sit back and relax and let the world come to you and let the world circle around you? Let, let the world do anything it wants and it can't touch you because you are no longer down in that dry, dusty desert. Having, having come to a place like this, Having heard these truths, you, you begin to get excited in a new way about them. You begin to see that that first taste of the water that came down from high, that first taste of the water, this, this is what begins to take away the thirst. This is what works. Before you were taking sand and calling it water, and then you couldn't understand why your thirst continued is because you took sand as water. See, when you take real water, even in an ordinary situation on a hot day and you drink water, your thirst goes away, doesn't it? Because the water is real. 
a really truly spiritual life if you have the water of life you begin to drink it and you get the taste for it and you begin to love it more than you love your self-deception of calling sand water if you love the truth more than anything else, you'll be, you'll be led to where that stream comes down. I don't care if you're a million miles away. I don't care how many bad, evil things. I don't care how hard you are. If you want the water of truth, you can have it because it itself will draw. You will sense the direction of it and you'll walk toward it. And you'll drink it, and once you drink it, you'll want to go higher and higher and find the original source, which is saying union with truth, union with reality. Let me give you some more thoughts on dealing with stress, tension, tightness. Think about this very seriously, please, what I'm going to say next. Would you agree that this is a wrong world. This world of everyone fighting individually and internationally, and inwardly, in the home. What is the home like? What is your home like? Would you agree that it's a world of wrongness in a thousand different ways? Now listen to what I'm going to tell you. Effective as of right now, I want you to think of the world's wrongness and your own wrongness, I want you to think of the wrongness that you live in as an intimidation. You know what it means to be intimidated? Have you ever been intimidated? Of course you have. Have you ever intimidated someone else? Put pressure on them. I want you to know that the wrongness of this on this earth is nothing but an intimidation which you don't see through as yet. You don't understand that it's not necessary at all for you to shake in front of it. You don't understand, you don't understand that there's no power whatever in people who are evil in any way at all. Well, we'd better find out why you do shake in front of people. Very simple if you want to see it. It's because you have the very same thing in yourself. If you are ever intimidated, intimidated by other people, it's because you still have the wish in yourself to intimidate other people, and that is a level. And that is a very destructive level. Start with that much. Begin to see that it's not necessary to be, I said it's not necessary to be scared of anyone or of anything, of anything about your life, whatever. You want to take that as a challenge? You can prove for yourself that it is absolutely true. Here, here are human beings like a man, he fell down and hit his head and he's sitting by the roadside in a daze and people are passing by him and he asks a passerby, this, listen, he asks a passerby this pathetic question. He asks a man who comes along, he says, do you know who I am? A woman comes along and the man with the dazed head has lost his identification, has lost his wallet. He says to the woman who comes along, do you know who I am? He asks the next two or three people, do you know who I am? I don't know who I am, who I am. can you tell me? And I want to tell you one of, the, one of the worst tragedies of this life that you live in. Every one of those people that he asks will tell him who he is and every one of them will deceive him. They will, they will tell him about his outlaw self and encourage him in that. All of society, all of society is against society. All of society is against the individual because all of them are a state, in a state of sleep and that's the only advice they can give. Do you, want to, do you want to start a truly spiritual life in which your mind is perfectly clear as to your identity so you'll know exactly who you are every second of the day? next week and next month and for the next five years, you'll know exactly who you are and what you will know, what you will know finally and forever that you really were not an outlaw after all. You thought you were.
You thought that that was the exciting life and the necessary life. No one ever told you different. You've been told different now. In the last few minutes, you've been told something entirely different. That you, do you know what you've been told? You have been told that you don't have to suffer anymore if you don't want to. Now let's try that one again. You've been told that you don't have to shake in front of the world of finances as you presently do. You don't have to tremble before other human beings like you used to. You've been told that you can be a free human being. Tonight you've been given a taste of the water that comes from a higher place. Taste it and you'll want to spend the rest of your life climbing the mountain to its pure source. Then all will be different. Some of, you, some of you young men who have been coming here recently and lately have just come to class. I'm going to give you a spiritual principle. Don't tell your crummy Questions, anybody? Yes? So you've been working harder on yourself and on what area? just been watching my thoughts. When Vernon was talking tonight, I uh, connected it with something that happened just before I came to school. I got angry at my son. Sylvia, so if somebody new asked you, what is this class all about? What, how would you answer them? It's a class on awareness. That's as close as I can to get to. More details. Okay. Class on awareness. What's that? Well, um, being aware of where you are at the moment that you're there, not thinking thoughts of uh, what happened yesterday or focusing too far on the, uh, the, fu on the future, um, being right where you are at the time you're there. Yes? Do you have any predominant mood? And if so, what would it be? Predominant state? I mean right now? Or any time? just as you observe yourself? Well, I think a lot about a lot of things. Just <laughs> things keep going through my head. Yes? How in touch are you with your feelings? Can you describe feelings inside of you? <clears throat> well, right now I'm pretty calm. Bye. Bernard said uh, early this evening that who do you love more, truth or your wife or your friend or the money? He said, no contest. There, I love more my money, truth, my job. I never uh, were aware of that. That's that uh, uh, process in me in this uh, half an hour that I was tasting. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, go to that point when I'm going to taste truth because it's in this moment no way. Another thing I uh, want Fernando say about the claim right in the town. Growing up, I I saw go and buy some locks and put it on my doors. It was like that. I am afraid to lose uh, the young I have in my house. Any question? Yes. Does that mean that you had a wrong reaction to uh, what Vernon was talking about? No. If your mind went to the locks. Oh, you mean when they said that the current ride was going on in this town? No, the only thing I saw was going and buy some locks and put on the, the door. Yes. Ernesto, is it hard for you to be alone with nothing to do? <laughs> I was 15 minutes in the apartment. I almost went crazy, you know. Yes. Have you seen something clearly in yourself in the last 24 hours? Well, I've been driving all day long, so 
I am I am sleepy uh, physically, right? So. Mm. I want three volunteers for the same subject. Three volunteers. Jim, two, Amy, three. Uh, we'll make uh, Gordon four. All of you speak on this same subject, please, all four of you, for a minute and a half. The harm in a false cheerfulness based on worldly rewards. False cheerfulness. What you're actually doing when you have a false cheerfulness is that you are playing a role. And when you're playing this role, you're trying to impress other people that this is the way your life is. And if you go along play, playing this role, you never can see beyond the role to see that you're not this image that you're trying to project to the world. And this class is to show us that we're not what we think we are. We're really vicious, cruel, hostile human beings. And we can't help but be this way because we're born asleep. And to be asleep is to be vicious and cruel. But we go around and play the role of the nice, happy, cheerful person. And we people, and we pretend that this is the way we are. So when something comes up in our life contrary to this, we won't even see it. We can't even see beyond the image that we are living. And when somebody tells us this, we become angry, which proves the point, but we don't see it. And you see this especially in positive thinking groups where people are always around smiling and, and they have a happy, cheerful face and they're always saying how nice they are and how loving they are. But yet, behind the mask is a different person. And, and people, people can't see, see through this. And when they come to this class and they're told the truth, they become upset. And they wonder why. And they say, well, uh, I resent what you said. Hi. Good evening. Hi. When Vernon said, based on earthly rewards, false cheerfulness based on earthly rewards. My mind raced around for a minute to try to connect it. And uh, I, thought, I think I thought of something that does connect exactly. I was listening to a broadcast by a, a, a Christian radio station, I believe, and I think uh, Reverend Sharp was talking about uh, if you wanted this new Mercedes-Benz to pray for this. If you wanted this success to happen uh, tomorrow, pray for this. Then he went, he, then he went into, into our, our inner nature. He said, if you want, that if you wanted to be treated in such, in, in, in such a manner, you must be this kind of a person. And every, every reward he was suggesting was a temporal reward. It, it existed in time. It had nothing, nothing of any value, of any permanent value. A new car, a promotion at work, a new job, and it was all connected with how the, what the person had to do right now to get this reward. He had to do several things. One was pray, one was uh, aspire to be more pleasant, and the whole thing was false. The earthly rewards that, one, the main earthly reward that hit me was friendship. If you smile at somebody, if you come, if, you, if you're real sweet and fond before people, they give you their friendship. That was the number one. And this, another one is money, and uh, money and all the materialism that go with it. That's all the world has to offer. And uh, the uh, phrase Vernon uses in here, selling your soul, applies to this. Because we, every time we, we're falsely cheerful to somebody because we want something from them, some earthly thing from them, we sell our soul. And we don't even know how, I don't know about any of you, but I don't even know how many times I <coughs> sold my soul today. I probably, d I'm sure I did sell it today. One of the tragedies of false cheerfulness is 
been with me most of my life is that with, if I get up in the morning, if I go out in the world and I put that on to get its rewards, there is absolutely no chance that I'm going to see the actual state that takes me out into the world. And I do. I, in, and in our families, it is put on us so early before we even know, before I even, even knew, that in fact I did have a mask, a smiling mask, to approach people. And it connects with what Vernon said earlier about protecting ourselves. And to put that on so that I will make my path smooth and protect myself will prevent me from seeing actually where that comes from, why I have the need to do that, why I must please the world. It's also impossible to see what the world actually is going to do to me. I've been with people in the past, some people we used to call street people, and they could pinpoint me quicker than I even knew they were doing it. They knew what that, small, that false smile would get them, and it was a very rude awakening. Four volunteers on a different subject. One, two, three, four. <clears throat> Complete inner disgrace, our one chance. Complete inner disgrace, my one chance. Complete inner disgrace to me means getting up here with nothing to say and having to face everyone, knowing that I can't, what Gordon said, put on a personality and hide behind it. Just, just letting you see that I don't really know anything, that I'm not what I appear to be. Uh, Everybody tells me that this is my only chance. Brother Vernon tells me that this is my only chance. Everybody else will tell you that, that your only chance is to be as everyone else in the world is, so that, the, so that you're not different inwardly. Um, inwardly, I'm just finding out that I'm not wonderful and that there's no one in this room or in the world that's any different than I am or any more scared. And that's, uh, that's disgraceful to me. I've been taught to be very, very brave. And uh, <laughs> there is nothing brave about me. I'll take any questions. Leland. What is the chance? What is the chance? I'm not quite sure, but I sense by being in this room and being close to the truth that there is a chance. I see a lightness that I don't ever, or that I've never seen in anyone else anywhere in the world. Hi. Uh, complete inner disgrace is my only chance, is what he said. Um, this connects very much with what the other subject was, in the world, everyone is striving to be number one in everyone else's eyes. And unless you live a life that, where you can see, in other words, to be, to be inwardly disgraced means that you see yourself how low you really are. When you have complete inner disgrace, that means you have seen how low you are. And once you see how low you really are, then you have a real chance for something higher to come in. Because you, as you are right now, cannot raise your own level. You have to be so disgraced that you give up entirely, and that's where your chance is. I'll take any questions on that. Larry. What is something for you to give up, Dave? Wanting to be number one. Leland. What is this higher level that you're talking about, Dave? When, a per when Leland disappears through seeing how low Leland is, something else will come in. Call it whatever you want. Can you think of any situation that you can tell us about in which you felt disgraced? Whenever anyone doesn't smile when I expect them to, I fall apart. And that I, that's disgrace. Jim? Is it difficult to you to admit that you're wrong? Yes. Yes, it is. Um. 
Complete inner disgrace is my only chance. Talk louder, please. Um, the first thing that came to my mind is just seeing the day that I went through today, seeing what I was and the thoughts that went through me. I didn't see anything worthwhile or anything worth keeping. I had a terrible day, a lot of negativity. I'd like questions on that. Jim. Lorraine, beyond that, do you still think that you're a pretty good person, aware of what is happening? Um, no, I don't consider myself real aware. Um, I don't act out a lot of the wrongness inside of me. I, I don't know. Zeno. Did you find today that you're hoping tomorrow is going to be better? Yes. Aidlin. What value, if any, is there in outer disgrace? <coughs> to let people see you as you really are so you can see yourself as you really are. It's very easy to hide and to lie to yourself. Yes. How do you protect yourself from inner disgrace? Um, not seeing what I'm really like. I, I have to pass around. Oh, oh, all right. These four are the next volunteers. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Lying about my actual condition is fatal. Lying about my actual condition is fatal. We lie all day long, 24 hours a day. I lie about everything. And I lie to try to keep Pat in place. But the thing I don't see is, is that keeping Pat in place by lying is killing me. I feel the pain of it, but I don't really see it. If I saw it, I'd do something about it. The longer I keep lying, the more pain I'm going to be in. I just, I refuse to see it. I refuse. Vernon always says that no human being would ever consciously hurt themselves. But why do I keep doing it? I do it over and over. Because, uh, as Vernon says also, we love it. We love to suffer. Because when we suffer, we're the center of the universe. I heard Vernon on a tape today say that he was talking about depression. And he said, you depressed little people, you all just love it. It is the height of egotism. You can sit in a little closet and say, oh, I'm depressed. I'll take any questions on this subject. Judith. Pat, when you say we lie to ourselves continually, also when we're standing up in front of the group, can you explain that more? Yes, like for instance, when, when you get angry about something, and this happens all the time, and you can be with another person and that person can say, are you mad? I'm not mad. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, you'll do that 10,000 times before you will once admit it. Try it sometime. Just once, just say, you're right, I was mad. Same subject, all four. Lying about my actual condition is fatal. <coughs> I don't think that I lie about my actual condition most of the time. Or if it's a lie, it's a hiding it, which is a, maybe a different kind of lie. I know in myself that I'm uh, very miserable, uh, that I'm a miserable wretch. So my lie consists in covering it and hiding it from other people. And that is, so that's a, the lie that I uh, live with. 
What happens if you don't hide it from other people? What happens is that my uh, exalted images um, will fall down further than I want them to fall down. I want a, a self-image uh, that is uh, pleasing to me. Jim? Are you appalled at what you see inside Nancy? Yes, it's, but you have, uh, it's not always appalled in the right way. In other words, you can take pleasure in evil. That's very good. Mm -hmm. Richard? What is uh, good about having your self-image fall down? Well, I would get to, I would have the reward of not to have to pretend anymore. Of be, of, I would be able to relax. Fine. Lying about my actual condition is fatal. We really have no choice but to lie. When we come into the world, our parents lie, everyone lies. So we have no choice but to live a lie throughout our entire lives until we meet something like we have here. And possibly the new people really don't know what is here because we don't understand fully what it is. <coughs> but the first thing, the fatal part of it is that we're going to live a lie and die never knowing why we are here on earth. The first thing we have to do is just to do what we're taught here, apply the principles and watch ourselves in our daily life. And we'll see for ourselves that we're living a big hoax and everyone around us is doing the same thing. We really don't know what it is to be honest with ourselves. We can see little glimpses of our evil, but we really can't take much, not at all. Are there any questions, Stella? An earlier assignment was to comment on false happiness. Would you comment on that? Yes, that, was, that would have been great for me to speak on because before coming to this class and even after coming, this was one of my traits, was to be cheerful, falsely cheerful. And I think that's what made me come here because I caught a glimpse of this. I caught a glimpse that the smile would go on when I wanted to be nice to people. And I saw that it was all phony. Completely phony. If I lie about my state, I'll never see it for what it actually is. In this class, you can't uh, get away with your state like you can in the world. Everybody buys each other's moods. Harvey? Is lying a demon that causes suffering? Sure. Mary Ellen? What benefit do you get from seeing your real state? <coughs> the opportunity to change. Billy? How does one learn to tell the truth? Seeing what's painful can't be right. Mm. 
Mike, Rod, Regina, and Eleanor. Here's the subject. Here is how self-tormenting liars can begin to face their painful lies. I just uh, have a total blank on that. I have no experience at all in my thinking with how to face that. Could I get questions? Okay, yeah, I'll go ahead if you're too blocked. Then. Go ahead. Um, coming to this class would be, uh, would you consider coming to this class a way of uh, facing your faults, um, your falseness? Um, absolutely, absolutely. Zena? Have you learned anything about yourself since coming to this class? Um, the very first thing I learned as I approached coming to this class was that I was a member of the Sleeping Society, and I believe that's a very important thing to notice about yourself. Right. Larry? <clears throat> Did you pretty well think before coming to this class that you was on a road up into heaven? No. Um, matter of fact, uh, one of the things that came to my mind all through my life was the fact that everywhere that I turned, uh, you could ask a scientist or a physician or a clergyman, what is the meaning of life? Nobody had the answer. One of the prime reasons that I'm here today is because I believe that when I read what Vernon had to say on that subject, that changing your nature is the purpose of life. I, I, I found one, a, one answer to the most nagging question in my life. Hi. Here's how um, self-tormenting liars can face their painful lies. Was that it? Yeah, close enough. Well, I noticed um, that I, every day I go to work, I'm leaving town at a certain time. And there's other people in the town who are jogging or going to the store or leaving town also for work at the same time. We all have a certain habitual pattern that we daily live with. What we first... so. In order to first, in order for us to, be, to first begin to suspect that we are lying, and that we are indeed tormenting ourselves, we have to admit that we're that the way we presently live our life is in a strict pattern, and that's one thing we don't want to admit. We we want to generally believe that we're much more original than that, and that certain aspects of our thoughts and our lives are valuable, and we have to admit, begin to admit, that maybe every pattern that I have in life is unnecessary or learned or not as valuable as I thought it was. Here is how self-tormenting liars can begin to face their painful lies. First of all, we have to see what a mess we've made of our own life. If we can't even admit that our own lives are a mess and that we don't know what we're doing with our own life, we have no chance at all and that's why the world doesn't have a chance. Only a very few people will say, I don't know where I'm going or what I'm doing with my life. Second, at all, second of all, we, we have to start calling pain, pain, and suffering, suffering, and seeing it in ourselves and dropping the role of being, being happy now already. And thirdly, we cannot do it alone. The human mind is so 
so completely uh, self-deceived, there is no possible chance without uh, a, an awakened man to guide us. And the only place I know where you can get that right kind of guidance often enough is right here in this class. I'll take questions. Mary Ellen. Can you think of anything that you love more than truth? <coughs> yes, my negativities. Is there anything that you can think of now that you specifically lie to yourself about? Lie to myself? Lie. To lie. Yourself about. Yes, uh, I saw something tonight. I, I have begun to take on a cheerful role at work and, and uh, all kinds of things I saw through uh, the discussion tonight. Hi. My whole life is, I live my whole life in torment and I lie about it. I, I refuse to see that I, I am living in pure torment and fear and just waiting to come up to talk tonight. I was just in pure torment and I even forgot the sentence and show it was to be mentioned again. I forgot the assignment. Um, any little thing can take me away, any little thing. Uh, this night, this tonight, um, a lady asked me, she came up and asked me uh, if I was Korean. Now that question just tormented me, just, I mean, I allow it to torment me. And then I lie about it. I says, oh, that was nothing. But all my life has been like that. I'll take questions. <coughs> uh, Linda. What, what's the connection as to why that, that would torment you? Why, why would being asked if you were Korean I, I don't, it's an identification. I think that I am something else. And being categorized as Korean, uh, I have an image of myself. I don't, I don't know how to explain that. Pat? How can you begin to change that, to not go through those lines? I can begin by dying to myself, dying to my false self. The images that I've grown up with and that I live now, I can see it and, and die to them. Um. <coughs> A couple thousand years ago, the Romans threw the Christians to the lions. Nowadays, the Christians throw decency to the lions. Now, take the word Christian. Talk about deviltry. Talk about viciousness. Talk about pure hatred. If you call yourself a Christian because you want to be somebody, you are a devil, not a Christian. Now I'll carry that a little further. If you have moral standards and you call yourself someone who lives by Christ's teachings or by the teachings of your church or by your moralistic code that you picked up somewhere. If you are living from that, I want you to know that you are a hater of your own goodness. What you have done when you call yourself polite and decent, what you have done is taking that as a substitute for the decency and goodness of reality itself. Understand that naming yourself anything dooms you to the hell of its opposite. You call yourself good and you go out preaching sermons and 
running for public office so you can save the world. You wreck the world. Whatever goodness a human being attributes to himself, he is the exact opposite. Now you find out this is a very subtle thing and you don't see the depths of what I'm talking about. You don't know how you are tormented by your so-called moral standards, which make you hard and bitter, and you'd like to kick over the whole mess, wouldn't you? But you're afraid that if you give up your pseudo-goodness that you'll be bad. You're bad lying about your goodness already. To be separated from God is badness. How much badder can you get? You don't know what it means to be good, to be decent. And what you want is another form. You don't want the kind of so-called goodness you have now because it torments you. You can't go out and do everything you want to do. See, this is restriction. This is the prison cell morality. What you'd like to do is find someone, some teaching, and there are millions of them who will justify you being the devil that you are so that you can behave like a devil and call yourself an angel. That's what you want, and that's how millions of human beings live. Now, if you don't see what I'm talking about clearly, it's still in you. If you don't see that anyone you meet out in that street will throw you to the lions for five cents. If you don't see that, you will throw someone else to the lions. And you do it all the time. I see you people right here in this room throwing each other to the lions, and you don't even know what I'm talking about. And it'll take five years for you to understand that, what I just said. Your state is your evil. Every time you talk to someone in a way to lean on them, you have thrown them to the lions because that's where you are. And you want someone else to help, to help you fight the lions inside yourself. Why don't you get out of the arena? The door is open. You can walk out anytime you want. No, you prefer to stay there and fight so that you can call yourself a brave gladiator, a crusader for righteousness. You live by names. You live by descriptions. And you're afraid to give them up because you fear you won't know who you are. And that's right. You won't know who you are. And afterward you will. When you've given it up completely, when your mind is no longer feeding you lies about your good marriage. Now you've been faithful to your wife and you lust after every woman you see. See, see what torment you're in. You have no morality, no decency at all. All you want to do is find someone or something to lean on. And you throw them to the lions and, and keep yourself in the cage too, the arena. You don't know the threat of the outside world and you're not able to free yourself from the threat of the outside world. You're only able to fear it and cringe from it because the outside world is in you. You're, you're, you're all, a pie. this is too mild, but I'll think of a stronger word later maybe. You're all nothing but a pack of weaklings. You have no strength at all, not one of you. All you want to do is find someone to lean on, something to lean on. What a pity. What a pity that you don't understand. Atheists, atheists don't understand that there is such a thing as God. It's too bad that you're not letting God lead your life for you. You want your life? You want to be in the arena? All right, you can fight. You can fight the lions. Look at all the lions in your life. How many lions did you fight today? That if you're fighting the lions, you'll try to get anyone else into that arena to fight with you to try to do your work for you. You want the glory of slaying the lions, but you want someone else to come in and help you and do the work for you. You, you don't understand what, what I'm talking about when I tell you to stop fighting and get up and walk out of the arena. There's a tunnel there. You can walk out anytime you want. You won't do it. 
You glorify your fear. You're so excited about your fighting and you're going to win over the lion tomorrow. It doesn't make any difference whether you win over the lion or the lion wins over you. It doesn't make any difference. You still remain in the arena to fight the next day. And you get up. You get up with a very strange contradiction every morning, don't you? You get up with, a, with a, first with the, the thrill of the thrill and the expectation of getting hurt by the lions. I said you get up with the thrill and the hope and the expectation of getting clawed and roared at. That's your life. You're not a gladiator at all anyway. You're just another lion in the arena fighting each other. I know that unless, and it's been said before, I've said it tonight, I know that unless God has called a human being to be saved, that he won't be, or her, man or woman, either one. I know that it's necessary to put out these truths, broadcast them, spread the seed, the word, as far as possible, to everyone possible. Then certain ones will hear and understand. Certain ones will get a taste of that water we talked about earlier, and they'll say, this is different from the sand. I, I thought that sand was water, but now that I've had my first taste of water, I see that this is water, and how foolish I was to call sand water. No wonder I was thirsty. And I know that a certain number of people, a certain small percentage of people, who hear what we're talking about here in these classes, a certain percentage will taste water. Just one teaspoon at first is enough. Because you can then see the difference between a teaspoon of water and a teaspoon of sand. You can see the difference. I know that truth, God, will lead a certain number of people to where the water starts to flow. And they will actually take it and drink it. Others will look at it and call it sand. Most, most so-called Christians, devils, will look at the water and call it, call it sand. A certain number of people in the this is all very personal to all of you here in this room tonight. What do you think about what's going on here? I see two or three new faces for some new people. What do you think that's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. I'll tell you that you've heard the pure truth here tonight. What are you going to do with it? But I also know, for the third time, I'm, I'm very glad that I don't have the responsibility for saving any one of you. I know that according to what God has decreed, to put it that way, some of you here in this room will go out of here and forget what you've heard. No, you won't forget it. It's too late for that. It'll be back in your mind somewhere for the rest of your life. Every one of you in this room, you'll never forget what you've heard here tonight. You'll try, but you won't succeed because you've heard the truth and it'll nag you. In that case, you only have one choice, but to come back either with books or tapes or here personally and begin to hear the truth that could set you free from your present wretched miserable hateful life which you'd like to get rid of but you don't know how and so you just hate it how stupid to just hate when you can change something good night